working in progress. <clears throat> okay, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful uh, for this Sabbath day, the blessings of it. And we just ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to speak to us. We know that you have been pouring out your spirit over this past week in a very powerful way. And our hearts do not feel capable or even worthy of receiving all of this light. We ask, Lord, that you can cleanse our hearts, that we can open the door of our heart to Christ, that he, we can remove the rubbish and that he can, can fill us. Please be with this movement, be with each person who is struggling to understand truth. Be with us now in this study, and thank you for all your goodness and love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. So uh, last night we had gone through quite a bit of chronology regarding 2020, uh, 2030. And um, I've been putting together this paper, and it's by far not even close to being finished. I, I hardly even call, call it started. Um, it's been uh, a lot of research, but also we've just been so caught up in, in our morning studies and all of the events of this past week. And, you know, I just find that the things that we are studying are so very convicting. So, so this paper by, <laughs> probably needs lots of editing still. But it's just some of my thoughts so far in trying to introduce this topic. So I'm going to just read for a little bit, and then I'm going to read some other material. But if we are to understand the present, we must learn the lessons of the past. The powers who in the past sought to control the world are still working. These three powers are symbolized in Revelation as the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet which are understood as globalism, communism, spiritualism, the UN, Catholicism, and Protestantism. While each of these individual powers has their individual goals, aims, and plans by which they seek to realize their view of an ideal world, they are actuated by the same spirit that has been manifested by Satan against Christ. This is seen in the first gospel promised should be your first gospel promise. I'm just going to correct this here. Which is couched in symbolic language in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It should not surprise us then that these three powers are united at the end of the world against God's people. Seventh-day Adventists have varying interests and emphases when they attempt to determine how end-time events will unfold. Some Adventists focus primarily upon the actions of, the Protest of Protestant America, since it is the U.S. that will cause all the world to wonder after the beast and his image. Others are more caught up in observing in the workings of the papacy and prophecies relating to the Antichrist power itself. Some see the encroaching ideology of the globalists and the secularization of our society as the place where the aims of the Sunday law will be realized. Of course, none see any singular one of these powers as the only cause for concern and having need for our attention. These are all related prophetically. There are two main statements by Ellen White that address this. The first is found in the Great Controversy. The second similar statement is in the Testimonies for the Church. Um, so we're going to read the one from the Great Controversy. Now, so far, it sounds okay, right? For uh, an introduction to a topic. It works. <laughs> 
Okay, so this statement here uh, has, there's some interesting things about these two different statements. They, they say some things very much the same, uh, but they're looking at it from a different perspective, and I find that rather interesting. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. So we can see that there's these two errors, and, and we're very familiar with this statement in the Great Controversy. So the immor immortality of the soul, of course, uh, the state of the dead, understanding that correctly is important, and also um, because that leads to spiritualism if you don't, and then, of course, the, the law of God, especially the Sabbath. So Satan has these deceptions to counteract um, the promises of God and sin and etc. And he does this in different ways. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. And they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So we're going to see here that it's the Protestants of the United States. So it's not the Catholics of the United States. It's the Protestants themselves. And they're going in here, it's seen as they're stretching their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism and, and reaching uh, over the abyss to clasp the hand of the Roman power. And, and, and thus we have this threefold union. Now, we don't really see uh, spiritualism in, in this depiction reaching its hand to, to grasp hands with, with the papacy. That is, we don't see the globalists and the papacy uniting hands, except through the agency of Protestant America. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Why, why does she depict it this way? Why is that in accordance with the Bible? Is there some reason that we would, we would need uh, the United States to be this medium of union? I think, yes, it is in accordance with the Bible, but it's also to show that the false prophet is the facilitator. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I would say because, um, now, some people might look at the Catholic Church and say, especially now under Pope Francis, well, it's very humanistic. I mean, it's very worldly, and, and I'm not saying it's not. But there is a divide between those two powers that is united in the United States. That if we didn't have Protestant America... Uh, making these types of concessions to each of these powers, I don't think those two powers could be united together, or at least not as easily. But, you know, I, I don't have a direct statement of that, other than that here we see that it's the United States that is the, uh, the facilitator, as Dwight says. Now, it's really interesting here, uh, what she says in this next paragraph, and I, I've never really noticed it before. Um, I mean, I've read it many times, but just it struck me more this time when I read it. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Now, this is something that Jeff documented in the 1990s. So what is it that spiritualism does? How does it imitate the nominal Christianity of the day? And... And this doesn't just happen in the 1990s, but how did spiritualism do this? From, from when it started in, in modern sp spiritualism in Ellen White's day, uh, how did it progress? How did it do this? Well, one of the core tenets of spiritualism is the fact, is in their mind that a soul is eternal. Okay, so we definitely have the the idea of the immortal soul. Now, Christianity, even though they would have believed in the mortal soul, unless you were Catholic, Catholics would do, you know, 
some of those types of spiritualistic things. But Protestants wouldn't. You know, Protestants did not talk to the dead or get caught up in spiritualism. But that has ch that changed, and it changed in a number of different ways. In, in Adventist history, you can see it with the idea of pantheism. And, and so spiritualism started to dress it up, dress itself up in Christian garments, that it was imitating nominal Christianity. So you can, you can go to churches uh, where if you went to, you know, some kind of new age celebration or you went to a, a, a Christian church, you would have a hard time telling the difference between what is happening. So this, these were types of things that were happening in the 90s, but they'd been progressively happening um, throughout the last couple of hundred years, at least. So spiritualism, a lot of people can't tell the difference between spiritualism and Christianity. That is, you can have different types of spiritualistic groups that really even profess to believe in Christ but are indeed not Christian. But then you also have Christian groups that really aren't that much different from spiritualism. So spiritualism is imitating nominal Christianity, and, and in so doing, because it's nominal Christianity, the Christian can't distinguish between the two. And you can have Hollywood even professing some kind of belief in Christ, people, actors, and so forth, some kind of spiritualistic ideas that might include something to do with Christ or Jesus maybe, but really are not very Christian at all. It's not about obedience to God. It's not about studying the Bible. It's, it's sort of magical, mystical kind of Christianity. So Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. <clears throat> Through the angel agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. So does this occur under the agency of spiritualism within Christian churches? I would have to think so. Yeah. Now, a lot of it is just hypnotism. I know, I mean, I'm not denying that Satan doesn't have spiritualistic powers. Um, but it's been demonstrated that um, much of the things that go on in Christian churches are really just hypnotist tricks. That is, hypnotists can get people to do all kinds of things that they wouldn't normally do. Um and, and this can happen in Christian churches. So you can have people slain in the spirit and all kinds of different things that go on. Um, it really is just the result of hypnotism. And, and spiritualism uses these tools to manip manipulate the mind. Drugs, music, all of these th things can bring on a spiritual experience, but it's not from God. And, and those things are being more and more a part of, of the Christian life. Christian in quotation marks, the Christian experience. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. We have to be careful because there is a great power to deceive. That is, Satan has sought to gain the sympathy of Christians in various ways while still uh, peddling his lie. He just puts it in a new package. Now, I, I put here in my note, the emphasis here is upon the acceptance and utilization of the two great errors, Sunday sacredness and immortality of the soul that deceive this Protestant nation and bring it, it should be bring it 
under the spell of Rome. So, so this is kind of interesting when, when we think about it, um, that this is going to lead to union with Rome. So this leads to a union of the U.S. with these two other powers. Spiritualism will imitate nominal Christianity. For those who emphasize spiritualism, the new age, etc., as the place to focus our prophetic eye upon, um, here they find support since this deception happens through the agency of spiritualism. Now, when I talk about that, uh, there are many Christians, at least when, when I first became an Adventist, who focus a lot on the new age, the new age deception, deception. and you will You'll see in the 80s and 90s and even probably recently, lots of um, exposés, Adventist books, showing how the New Age is infiltrating Christianity and, and how it's even infiltrated Adventism in the sort of New Age uh, health message that's coming to Adventism through, uh, through you know, the health food stores and all that type of thing. So the fact that we have sort of have these you know, vegetarian diet and, and an emphasis upon health that's caused new age ideas to come into Adventism regarding health. Now, most conservative Adventists are quite aware of the dangers of, of um, you know, iridology or reflexology or these different types of things. But there are other ones that are uh, disguised a little bit more, uh, but really are just spiritualistic, like the different types of foot baths that are supposed to draw toxins out of your body. And these are just magician tricks. They're, they don't do anything or the different types of colon cleanses and so forth. Uh, these things have been around for a long time, long before Adventists had anything to do with them. And they're just, the person themselves doesn't realize the trick of them. One of the ones that uh, affected me personally, um, my oldest son, Matthew, when he was a little kid, he had ear infections. And um, the doctor that we had, because... Um, uh, most of my kids were born with a midwife. We had this sort of doctor who worked with the midwives. And so um, so we would go see him, and, and he would always give us a uh, an alternative medicine choice and anything that had, because we wouldn't buy drugs. So, so he knew that we weren't going to use drugs, so he would always give us some alternative medicine. And um, so with my son, Matt, he, um, he had this ear infection, you know, from about the age of two, and it, and it constantly reoccurred. And we tried, you know, different types of, of natural health things. But when he was about 13, um, his ear infection had got to the point where he, he wasn't hearing out of his ear very well, um, but also it, it didn't hurt him anymore. And um, I had a, a guitar student who was a doctor, actually a pediatrician, and I mentioned this about the problems we were having with my son's ear, that it was running all the time. And he said, well, you need to get to see a specialist. So we went to see a specialist. And um, if we hadn't done that, my son Matt would have been dead in about a month. His uh, mastoid bone had rot rotted out of his head. Um, now, I bring this up because one of the treatments we were using was a thing called ear candling. So I don't know how many people are aware of this thing. It's It's a uh, it's a wax hollow tube that's covered in beeswax and you put it in the ear and it's supposed to draw out all of this, these toxins and so forth. And, and you know, we were sort of desperate and we try, had tried this for a while, but, um, you know, it didn't have any effect. And so Matt had to have his uh, head cut open and they had to remove all the rotten bone. It was almost to his brain. So it was, there's a barrier there, I guess, that. Uh, in about another month, it would have been affected. It would have gone into his brain, and he probably would have died. So, um, um, but, you know, one of the things I've learned is that uh, you can't depend upon these sort of alternative medicines, especially when they have no basis in in sort of reality. It was really when I started to look into it afterwards, I started to realize the mystical nature of this so-called cure for ear infections. and that you would get the same results whether you put it on an ear or just uh, just burned it on on anything. It would always create like what looked like were toxins that it was drawing. So um, so anyway, that's kind of an aside a bit. But when it comes to this these here, and we're going to look at this in a bit more detail. 
because we're going to be addressing the World Economic Forum and, and its role. Because it's not openly what we would call New Age. That is, New Age has been, or, or spiritualism has been constantly changing and shifting its emphasis. But we would have to say that the woke um, ideology, if you want to call it that, is nothing more than spiritualism. I think we'd all have to agree with that. And even this emphasis upon uh, the dangers of global warming or the dangers of capitalism, all of these things are really sp the results of spiritualism. They're ideas that come from spiritualism, but they're not clothed in spiritualistic terms any longer. Um, so, of course, people recognize the place and power of Rome in this exchange. Here, it's uh, the U.S. Reach, reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of Rome while stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. It's interesting that in the quote from the testimonies below, this characterization is reversed. And, and I wonder why it is. So I don't necessarily have an answer. But when we look at this, instead of the United States reaching over the abyss to clasp the hands of Rome, it's going to do that to clasp the hands of spiritualism. And then it's going to reach across the gulf, not to grasp the hand of spiritualism, but to uh, grasp the hand of Rome. So by the decree of enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hand of spiritualism. So you can see there that those two things are reversed. So the gulf to clasp the hand of spiritualism in this one, but the abyss to clasp the hand of spiritualism in this one. So the gulf and the, the, the two are reversed. When under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. Now, the focus here is the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God. That is, what's focus, the focus here in this uh, statement in the testimonies, if you read the whole section, is um, about the preparation for what's coming, the persecution that's coming, and what we do as Seventh-day Adventists need to do to prepare for it. And that's because what would be the reason that the statement in the testimonies has a different emphasis than the statement in the Great Controversy? Great controversy is is meant more for dissemination to the world. The testimony is more for that within the church or movement. Right. Now, um, anybody have any ideas of why she switches the wording in these two passages, the one in the testimonies, the one in the great controversy? Because basically they're almost the same statement except the reversal. Anybody have an idea of what that might mean? Is it for our admonition for us to pay attention with? That would be my, 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 my instinct, is that Ellen White does things and the Bible does things sometimes that when you're just reading them superficially, uh, you don't notice the detail. But when you start to delve into it, you see see something, and it should draw your attention to it. So that, that's the way that I would look at it. So that would at least be that. Now, the focus here in the testimonies is on not so much the workings of spiritualism. Um, and... and um, and an examination of the underlying causes of the deception that leads to the Sunday law. So that is in the former one. 
But in the latter, this statement into testimonies, the emphasis is upon the decree itself, the results, and the needed preparation for God's people so that they are not deceived. There are two different audiences intended and thus two different emphases. <clears throat> now, here my writing is going to be a little bit weak because it's just something I put together um, and have not even read over. So, um, while this study is directing its attention to the plans and deceptions of the dragon power, so spiritualism, as seen in the agenda of the World Economic Forum, the WEF, which are to be understood as the plans and aims of globalism, we recognize that these plans will ultimately fail. More specifically, the globalists only rule the world through the means of the USA, while it also holds hands with the pap papal power. The USA is instrumental in bringing these powers together, as Sister White so aptly illustrates in the quotes above. Jeff Pippinger, in addressing Daniel 1141, understood that the symbol of hand represents the power or authority, especially in a persecutory sense, being exercised against God's people. So this uh, is from, uh, I believe it's page 51 of uh, in Time of the End magazine. In verse 41, we see those who escape out of his hand. In this phrase, the word hand is a prophetic symbol which portrays the power and authority exercised by a conqueror. When Protestantism clasps hands with Catholicism, it is in reality a subjugation to the spiritual authority of the papacy. The symbolic use of the word hand and the movement or march of the King of the North are also used by the spirit of prophecy when addressing these identical issues and time periods. He actually gives some examples of that. Um, and this, I'm going to go on, this is going to be more from uh, Ellen White here in a minute dealing with this. Okay, so I say this threefold union does not require a change in Rome. While well, spiritualism imitates nominal Christianity, Protestant changes by adopting liberal ideas. Rome's goals, its plans, are long-reaching, brought about by a satanic patience. So the papacy's plans are long-reaching. Now, when I think about this, um, and this is something I, I need to flesh out a little bit, but when we look at spiritualism, what's the problem with spiritualism as far as reaching its goals? the spiritualistic world, what would be the problem? And I would say it's apparent goals. But it's the thing going only so far and needs help to continue. Okay, so so spiritualism, one is we could see it's it's really a divided kingdom. Isn't Satan's kingdom divided? True. Yeah, it's true. And, and we can see that, you know, there's many different flavors of spiritualism. It's constantly changing and adapting. Its, it's basic tenet is, is destruction of God's law. And that is, spiritualism exists to destroy. So when spiritualism has its goals, for instance, the communist revolution, why did the communist revolution not succeed? Why couldn't spiritualists have thought of a system that could bring about their, their touted goals? Why, why did the reality differ so from different from uh, the sales job? Why did the propaganda not not work out because it was not built in reality yeah so it's not built in reality it, it's a fantasy spiritualism is about a fantasy but also behind it all is satan and satan is a destroyer he can't really build anything well okay but it also boils down to that our adversary cannot create anything Mm -hmm. So well, if he if he cannot create or restore life, 
then how is he to be able to create a, let's say, a, a unified way of ruling? Yeah. And, and that's the thing that I find as I go through this book, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab and, and Terry Malaret, um, it's so juvenile. I mean, these are the kinds of things I would have thought of when I was, you know, 12 years old. Uh, it's so out of touch with reality and so based on fantasy. And, and, and some of the videos I've watched, and I can't think of the guy's name, but you know, the guy who talks about the human being can be hijacked. I mean, this guy's a nutcase. He lives in a complete fantasy world. Everything that he's saying that they can do, it, it's science fiction. But he really believes it. And, and so there's something about this, this um, the globalist agenda that is really just destructive. Now, there's, there's a principle I learned a number of years ago that when somebody uh, tries to, um, let's say somebody says, this is what the results that they want. You know, they, 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 you know, they talk all these nice words. We'd like to, you know, accomplish this task or whatever. But everything that they touch always ends up the opposite of what they say. That is, they never reach their goals. Well, we can know that the goal that they achieve is the goal that they're seeking. Uh, maybe I didn't put it the best way, but let's say you have somebody who's, you know, in the church or something, and they're like, oh, we need to work together and we need to cooperate. But everything they do is the opposite of cooperation. They have secret meetings. They do things behind people's back. They tear each other down. They're doing everything to destroy unity or cooperation. So it doesn't really matter what someone says. And we can see this with the World Economic Forum. They have this propaganda machine. It's, it's a very juvenile plan, but there's no way that their plan can work. It, it's like, here's an example. Uh, my son James, when he was little, he, he used to think that he was an inventor. He used to invent all kinds of things. So, you know, he'd be like 10, 11 years old. And he would have all these things that he could design. You know, he said, I don't know why any people don't just build this thing. It's so easy. And the one thing he, he had designed in his mind was a thing called the Superman pad. And if he could build it, he could have superpowers. You know, and of course, you know, as he started to get older, he started to realize it was kind of foolish. But that's kind of what the World Economic Forum is like. It's like a child living in a fantasy world believing that they can do something, but they haven't the slightest idea of what they're talking about. Um, they just don't know anything about reality. And so one of the things I can say from studying all of this material is that whatever the World Economic Forum's plans are, it is really just a destructive. It's really only about destroying society. Everything that they're doing is destructive to society. It may, it may sound like they want to have equity and all these wonderful things and prosperity and have the world to be a better place, but there is nothing in what they are planning that could possibly lead to a better world. Now, sure, many of them probably believe their propaganda, but behind it all is Satan who really is just trying to destroy God's creation and destroy God's people. So the part or the role that um, spiritualism plays in this threefold union is really a destructive role. And that destructive role opens the door for the papacy to step in. But does that make sense to people, what I'm saying there? Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Okay, so uh, this statement here, this is a fantastic statement. Um, and this is the religion which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor, Catholicism. So in her day, people were starting to, um, there was sort of a movement going on um, 
well, we can see it with the Oxford movement and so forth. It was kind of this um, nostalgia for Catholicism, which was one thing that was going on. Um, so it was a sentiment, 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 sentiment was basically sentimentalization, sentimentalization um, of Catholicism. So they were starting to um, gain the affections of, of Protestants by how they were being ca characterized in novels and, and, uh, and, and different types of forms of entertainment. Um, so, so, so this is what was happening in, in Ellen White's day. But she says, this union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism. For Rome never changes. So one thing we can see is we can see the United States changes. And spiritualism imitates, um, you know, Protestant America, uh, apostate Protestantism, nominal Protestantism. But Rome does not change. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. Now, remember Parminder and Tess, and um, uh, Tyler was involved in this as well. When uh, In 2019, when Tyler and Tess came up to Alberta, Tyler was presenting on what it means to be uh, a conservative and what it means to be a liberal, and they were promoting this idea that we need to be liberals. Why is it that liberal ideas? Now, Ellen White talks about conservatism in a, in a negative sense, as well as liberalism. So, so we need to understand what she's talking about. But when she talks here about the adoption of liberal ideas on the part of Protestantism, that brings it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism, what is she talking about? Is it really the same thing that Parminder and Tess and Tyler were talking about? Or is it something else? I can't really recall what they were talking about too much, just tiny fragments here and there. Well, it was the idea that we need, you know, CNN and MSNBC, we need oh, to yeah. We need to be sympathetic with homosexuals and and um, you know black oppression and all these types of things, right? So so the adoption of liberal ideas are these ideas that sound good on the outside, but really they are not they're not connected to obedience with God. And and we can see that Catholicism, it. It can, Catholicism is a liberal institution in a lot of ways. It's both conservative and liberal, depending on what you're looking at. Because Catholicism, even though it's, it's rooted in this long tradition, that long tradition is a tradition that comes from Rome. And what is the characteristic of Rome that the Catholic Church uh, emulates? How did Rome conquer? Well, they would adopt a lot of the trace or a lot, a lot of the gods and goddess and customs of the lands that they invaded and conquered. Yeah, which was but very different from, from yeah, yeah. Politically, that, yeah. I just say politically, they politics. Yeah. So normally, what happened when when countries would conquer? is they would impose their gods upon the people they conquered. But the Catholic Church never did that. It allowed people to keep their gods. They just had to bow to Rome. And, and this is what the Catholic Church has done. In, in wherever it is in the world, it differs in, in the customs and traditions that, that are part of its worship. 
uh, to a large degree. It's going to be very different in Mexico than it is in the United States, in Europe, on, on the types of practices uh, that occur within the Catholic Church. Uh, because this is the idea that they came from Rome. And, and yet there are things in which it's immovable. So when it says Rome never changes, I mean, it adapts and adopts things, but there is a, a part of Rome that is iron, that oh, is inflexible, yeah. that's, that's inflexible. And that and that is its authority. It's in the authority of the Pope and in its basic doctrines. So, so I mean, Rome on the surface can appear to adapt, but it's still always Rome. But Protestantism does change. It changes all of its principles, which is based upon the protest of Rome, to the acceptance of Rome. The Bible, the Bible is the foundation of our faith, was the cry of Protestants in Luther's time, while the Catholics cried, the fathers, custom, tradition. Now many Protestants find it difficult to prove their doctrines from the Bible, and yet they have not the moral courage to accept the truth, which involves a cross. Therefore, they are fast coming to the ground of the Catholics and using the best arguments they have to evade the truth cite the testimony of the fathers and the customs and the precepts of man. So we can see that the authority now is no longer God's word. The authority becomes the authority of, of the church, of man. Yes, the Protestants of the 19th century are fast approaching the Catholics in their infidelity concerning the scriptures. But there is just as wide a gulf today between Rome and the Protestantism of Luther, Cranmer, Ridley Hooper and the noble army of martyrs, as there was when these men made the protest, which gave them the name Protestants. So true Protestantism can have no uh, agreement with Rome. There's a huge divide. And yet we can see that within Christianity, within Adventism, and within this movement, the papal spirit still exists. That is, we haven't fully understood the influence that the papacy has had. <clears throat> now, my writing is going to get weaker and weaker as we go through this here, but um, I'm going to read this anyway. This is just see if this makes sense. Uh, in examining the dragon power or globalism in its present manifestation under the auspices of the World Economic Forum, we will see that there is no reason to believe that their stated goals or aims can be realized. The dragon power is primarily destructive in its methods. The stated goals and aims are a cloak for its true intentions. Everything that the WEF, WEF seeks to achieve can only result in the dismantling of the world's economy. The solutions to the world's problems are juvenile, low resolution solutions with no apparent appreciation of the complexity of reality. The WEF overstates its power to control humanity. It may boast of technologies that can hijack the human organism, but no such power exists since God has not given that power into the hand of man or men. For Satan to control the human agent, the heart must be yielded to him. The Christian cannot, indeed must not, fear him that can destroy the body. Why are we then looking at the goals of the World Economic Forum? First, we have just experienced the global pandemic in which the WEF has played a major role in shaping public policy. This experiment in control was to see how far they could push that arbitrary authority before a counter response would be seen. There's no doubt that these past two years are preparatory for the Sunday law itself, even if the players involved are unaware of the fact. The WEF is not interested in religious goals. It is a secularist and humanist institution. 
the supporters of the WEF and the Great Reset, probably believe the propaganda. The elites are naive in their appreciation of the problems they seek to solve. They fail to grasp the underlying causes. Their blame is directed at Christianity itself, especially the Protestant form. Catholicism they see as impotent, and thus they do not fear the power of the papacy, even while they court it. If there is any obeisance to Catholicism, it is merely in an acknowledgement of its traditions. Uh, the papacy in its present form is progressive. While it appears as such, the world sees it as an ally. So we've seen some of that happening. In the eyes of the World Economic Forum, its enemy is Protestant America and the American Constitution. These are the obstacles that lie in its path of progress. The American freedom is seen as unbridled, selfish, and the cause of the issues that need to be resolved, poverty, climate change, war. American policies and institutions are seen as oppressive. Capitalism is characterized as the oppressor and not as it should be seen, the provider of wealth. The main source for our information, so, so let's just unpackage some of what I wrote here. So I make a number of claims. Um, can we see that globalism's main enemy is America in the first place? And you got people like George Soros too. Yeah. Yeah. So so we have all of these these people who want to destroy America and especially capitalism. Now they got this term which is uh uh stakeholder capitalism in contrast to shareholder capitalism. So anybody know what the difference is between a shareholder capitalism and stakeholder? I mean, we're going to get into this. So shareholders is the shareholders of a corporation. So you buy shares and, and the corporation is beholden to its shareholders. Stakeholder capitalism means that everyone who's affected by that company's action is um, should be involved in that. Of course, it's, it's never going to happen, right? Because it's really about uh, could, uh, the elites controlling other companies. So really, it's just a way of it's it's a type of crony capitalism. So it's uh, it's not what it professes to be. But so they say that everybody who's affected, so that corporations need to be responsible to the environment, uh, you know, to the health of its of of everyone. Everyone, in a sense, is uh, the corporations are are responsible to everyone not just to act as corporations. Now, they believe that capitalism then is, is a destructive force, and we, we will see that here in a minute. Um, so the main source for our information for this uh, study is from the book COVID-19, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab and Terry Mallorit, written in June of 2020. The book is a propaganda piece and should not be taken as anything more than this. It is selling an idea without any consideration as to the veracity of its claims. In the context of the pandemic, they suggest that we should take advantage of this unprecedented opportunity to reimagine our world in a bid to make it better and more resilient, one a more resilient and a better and more resilient one as it emerges on the other side of this crisis. So in June 2020, they, um, they believed the pandemic was going to be a huge crisis. Of course, what was the crisis that came as a result of the pandemic? Where did the crisis come from? Was the pandemic itself a crisis? It depends on what pandemic you're talking about. It's a pandemic of propaganda, real horrible lies and restriction of liberty yeah so so the response to the pandemic did more damage than the pandemic itself right we can we can all agree on that and especially when it comes to the vaccination 
but but even more than that, all of these these restrictions uh, definitely destroy the economy. And the people that are going to die from starvation as a result of the pandemic um, are much greater than the people that would have died from the pandemic itself if left to itself. So, and, and this is what we always find, especially in the world of environmentalism. You know, there's some problem that exists um, and so man comes up with a solution. You know, an example would be, oh, we got lots of, uh, you know, rodents or something and so we get some other animal or we bring some other species in to to be a predator and that ends up being more of a problem than the original uh, problem things like that um or you know we're not going to cut down any forests we're going to keep these old growth growth forests because they're going to be uh good for those animals that live there but you need old growth you don't you need fires to come and burn down old growth forests that's natural. That's the way things were. So they start now then having to do controlled burns. Um, but but the point is that man tries to to create a solution to a problem. But often the problem is not real. It's just perceived. So there's no evidence that this reimagining will make this world better. The ideas put forth in this book will not make the world more resilient than it already is. So. Is this world resilient? Are human beings resilient? Yes. Yeah. Man is very resilient. I mean, so why do we need to make him more resilient? And is this even going to make man more resilient? I see that it's going to weaken humanity because it takes away the responsibilities from the individual which weakens the individual. Resiliency is not the result of public policy. Right? So the proposals in this book will make the world less resilient, if anything. So that's as far as I got as far as writing. I've got a lot of research. Now, um, I'm going to read a couple of things here. Now, I do have the book in... Um, on a PDF, but it's hard to find on it. The, pa the, the pagination is different in the book I have, but I will go there. So now the page I have to get to is quite a ways away. Okay, so they're going to deal with some ideas that they don't seem to have any idea about, which I find. Okay. Now they're going to address here economics. Um, and I'm going to deal with some of their nonsense here. So So they talk about the economic fallacy of sacrificing a few lives to save growth. And, and, and so this is just, this is where we're going to um, address here um, and try to see what's underlying all of this. Try to look beyond their rhetoric. Okay, throughout the pandemic, there has been a perennial debate about saving lives versus saving the economy, lives versus livelihoods. This is a false trade-off. Now, uh, it's interesting how they turn things around um, in the type of, of, of way that they do it. So hopefully we can, we can see what they're, gonna, what they're doing. From an economic standpoint, the myth of having to choose between public health and a hit to the GDP growth can easily be debunked. So first thing we're going to see is how they, they characterize this. So why do they characterize this as a hit to the GDP growth? Notice they're not talking about the individual businesses that are affected by these lockdowns. Why are they talking about the GDP growth? What is their purpose in using that type of language?
because they're, they're putting these two things. We have this, this, they're setting up this five false dichotomy that's being presented. Public health and the GDP, the gross domestic product. Is that what this is about? Do, do the locked, was anybody concerned about the gross domestic product when it came to the mandates shutting down businesses? Well, probably if you had a business, you know, be concerned. Well, but you wouldn't care about the gross gross domestic product. You know, that's just, you'd be care about your own business. If you had a, a business that was directly affected, but they're not talking about that. They're talking about this this big impersonal GDP growth. But that, and, and also we know that the large corporations weren't affected. So here in Canada, at least, and it's probably true in other places, uh, were the Walmarts shut down? No. Could people buy clothes at Walmart? Yeah. Could you buy clothes at a local clothing store, a small clothing store? You couldn't, they were shut down. Why? Why could you buy clothes at Walmart, but not buy clothes at your local clothing store? Why were the little shops shut down? So, so we can see that the big corporations really weren't affected and, and many of them actually prospered. Um, so, so they set up this really this, this, the way that they ch deal with this language here, choosing between public health and the GDP. Well, it's not about the GDP. It's about people. It's really about public health. It's the question is, is this, this one response to public health, we need to recognize how it affects public health overall. So it wasn't really an argument so much about GDP growth. It was about the fact that people are going to be unemployed. People are going to uh, be doing more drugs. They're going to have marriage breakdowns. The whole system is breaking down. It's, it wasn't about the GDP growth. So it says, leaving aside the not insignificant ethical issue of whether sacrificing some lives to save the economy is a social Darwinian proposition or not, deciding not to save lives will not improve economic welfare. So again, there's just the language they're used, sacrificing some lives. Is that what people were suggesting when they were opposed to, to the lockdowns? I don't think that's what was being suggested. Well, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't suggesting it, no. No, they're just saying that what you're doing isn't going to save lives. Um, and it's just not about. Uh, so anyway, they say here, the reasons are twofold of why, you know, we shouldn't do this, why, why we should do these, uh, these uh, restrictions. And they're going to put out a, a faulty argument. I mean, it's, it's definitely not based on any kind of economics, I understand. So on the supply side, if prematurely loosening the various restrictions, the rules of social distancing result in an acceleration of infection, which almost all scientists believe it would, more employees and workers would become infected and more businesses would just stop functioning. After the onset of the pandemic in 2020, the validity of this argument was proven on several occasions. They ranged from factories that had to stop operating because too many workers had fallen ill primarily the case for work environments that forced physical proximity between workers, like in meat processing facilities, to naval ships stranded because too many crew members had been infected, thus preventing the vessel from operating normally. An additional factor that negatively affects the supply of labor is that around the world, there were repeated instances of workers refusing to return to work for fear of becoming infected. In many large companies, employees who felt vulnerable to the disease generated a wave of activism, including work stoppages. Now, I mean, this is just basically completely not true. So, and, and part of that is because you can pick and choose um, 
distortions of reality when it comes to the media. Now, for the most part, people in, in other countries where they didn't have restrictions, did we see people just dropping dead in the streets? No, like Japan's a good example of that. Yeah, and, and, and Sweden and places like that. So there's lots of places around the world where people did change their behavior, but they did so according to their own um, assessment of the risk. But when you have forced restrictions, a lot of them don't make sense. That is, a person who's making the decision on the floor knows the conditions and the situations that affect that business. But when you have those decisions made from large government that's unconnected with every, like you can't have a one size fits all policy. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. So, but that's what they're, they're doing. So they're presenting, they're using some examples where there was meat processing facilities where people got sick. Um, because they have to work in close proximity. But that doesn't mean that you should shut down the entire economy. And, and where were people getting sick from mostly? You know, one of the things about if you have Walmart operating, way more people are going to go be going to Walmart and expose people to an illness than if people are going to a local business, a smaller business. The more people that are mixing in a spot. So, so the whole weakness to the system is that um, they were shutting down businesses where illnesses weren't being spread and keeping businesses open where illnesses were being spread. So, so the whole idea is just propaganda. But they're arguing here that if we didn't do these restrictions, it would be worse for the economy because people would be getting sick. So we need to do these restrictions. And maybe for the first few weeks, you know, it might have made sense. But definitely not for the length of time that these restrictions have been in place. On the demand side, the argument boils down to the most basic and yet fundamental detriment of economic activity, sentiments, now, this is one of the most ridiculous arguments I've, I've ever seen. It says here, because consumer sentiments are what really drives economies. Now, is that true? Is economy, are economies driven by sentiment? No, I wouldn't say, I would not say so. Okay, there's, there is a thing, supply and demand. Uh, I don't know if I would call these sentiments, um, but maybe they mean something different. But it's not what drives economic activity. There's needs that basically drive economic activity. A return to any kind of normal will only happen when and not before confidence returns. So what they're saying is it's about confidence. This is a Keynesian economic idea. It's not based on reality. It's not about confidence. Individuals' perceptions of safety drive consumer and business decisions, which means that the sustained economic improvement is contingent upon two things, the confidence that the pandemic is behind us, without which people will not consume and invest, and the proof that the virus is defeated globally, without which people will not be able to feel safe first locally and subsequently further afield. Now, if this really were true, all that you would need to do is make the media uh, put everyone at ease. And everything that the media was doing was to destroy, to instill fear. And, but there is a reality. People have to consume. Whether I, I eat food or not is not based upon sentiment. Whether I have a place to live. Uh, is not based upon sentiment. I need a place to live. These are actual real needs. Demands are created because there's need. And people will 
continue to consume and invest, not because they have some confidence, but because of the actual necessity of having to do so. So the, these are completely false, false ideas. Well, how they characterize supply and how they characterize demand are, are completely false economic ideas that they're presenting. So, so they have these juvenile ideas regarding economics. And, and so we're, we're going to go through this as we go through these studies. We're, we're going to go through a lot of this book and, and other things as well. But I really want people to see um, how this, this World Economic Forum, in spite of the fact that it, it, it tries to characterize itself as powerful, uh, we will see that it's actually not very powerful. That it doesn't have the power that it professes to have, uh, which I found quite quite interesting as I started to to look into this further. Um, to some degree, Klaus Schwab is just a scam artist. He appeals to the elites, he sells them a product, and he makes a lot of money. But his plans and his goals have no chance of ever being fulfilled because they're not founded in reality. <clears throat> um, so now he's going to say this here. Uh, uh, the logical conclusion of these two points is this. Governments must do whatever it takes and spend whatever it costs in the interest of our health and our collective wealth for the economy to recover sustainably. As both an economist and public health specialist put it, only saving lives will save livelihoods, making it clear that only policy measures, measures that place people's health at their core will enable an economic recovery, adding, if governments fail to save lives, people afraid of the virus will not resume shopping, traveling, or dining out. This will hinder economic recovery lockdown or no lockdown. So one is, do the governments have the ability to save lives? Is the government interested in saving lives? Can somebody give an argument of why they're not in favor of, of saving lives, why the government doesn't care about lives? Well, well, look at the UN wanting to reduce the world's population to 500 million. That really reeks. But then you're thinking, uh, well, if no one's there or there's so few people there to, to feed you guys money, you <clears throat> demonic parasites, <clears throat> then you're self-destructing right there. I mean, you can't keep destroying people and expect to maintain your own lives. But these people think they're, they're demigods. They're possessed with demons. Okay, so one thing we know is that people act in their own interest. It's just human nature. Governments are not altruistic. Politicians and the people under them or over them, or however you want to look at it, are making decisions because they're looking out for number one, which is nothing, nothing necessarily wrong with that. You're going to make decisions based on how it's going to benefit you. Now, you might, you might buy into some of the propaganda how you're actually helping others, but governments will sacrifice individuals for what they call the greater good. What's the problem with that idea? Because really that's what they're doing. They're characterizing this pandemic as, well, we're concerned about lives, but actually they're sacrificing lives for the greater good themselves. Right? Everybody has to get vaccinated. And, and why, what, what's behind the idea that everyone has to get vaccinated? So, for instance, when I had my children, I'd already knew that I wasn't, they weren't going to get vaccinated. 
because I looked at the risk of vaccination and the purported benefit of that vaccination. And I recognized that my children would be at greater risk by being vaccinated, even if vaccinations worked, than if I left them unvaccinated. So what would be the argument of why I needed to vaccinate my killed children? What would be the argument do you suppose? Some of you may have run into this if you've had children. Oh, it's supposed to stop them from becoming ill. Well, they get a lot sicker. I mean, I was vaccinated. Vaccine, you know, harmed myself, and so was at least one of my children. I yeah. just, had, you know, stoke up your natural immunity. It's given them God; it will protect you. Okay, so, so the argument that people will put is that if everybody did what you did, if everybody made the same decision I made with my children, then. There, nobody would be vaccinated, and then these diseases would run rampant. So we can't just let some people opt out, because that's unfair. You need to get vax. You need to have your children vaccinated, just like I'm vaccinating my kid. That would be the argument. Even though you that's going to put your children at an unnecessary risk. What's that, Jeff? I was going to say, even though people are still getting sick with the vaccinations, too. Yeah, I know. But, you know, I'm talking about, like, even childhood vaccinations. The one particular is pertussis. And um, uh, yeah. before I was married, before I had kids, I watched uh, on TV, they had one time a, a public health announcement about, uh, you know, children needed to get vaccinated against uh, whooping cough. And they gave the statistics of the risk associated with the vaccine and the risks, risks associated with getting whooping cough. What they didn't, what they failed to tell people is what was the chances of getting exposed to whooping cough? Very, very, very small. And so, so I just did the math and I recognized, well, even if the vaccine works, my children are being put at greater risk by getting the vaccine. But see, the argument that people will have is, well, you need to sacrifice your children for the greater good. And that, that's the idea of, of communism, of socialism. And, and that can't, that principle is false because in the end, we end up we end up having our children pass through the fire. All in the name of this new age religion. The government is not to raise our children. We're to raise our children. We make the decisions for our children that we consider to be the best. You know, one is my kids. I had no plans of them ever going to school. So they weren't going to be exposed to a bunch of kids, you know, uh, carrying viruses anyway. And they say, well, if you don't get vaccinated and your kids can't go to school in British Columbia, where we lived at the time, I said, well, my kids aren't going to go to school. So, um, so this is, you know, this is an issue that when it comes to what we see happening in the world is we see that um, we have these different groups who have these agendas. And, and especially when we're looking at the globalists, globalism is seeking to control the individual. The United States Constitution stands to protect us from these types of tyrannies, which is why the American Constitution is hated. Now, some of you may not remember, but Tyler, when he was, um, you know, presenting this conservative liberal thing that we should be liberals, they were representing the American Constitution as, as saying that the American Constitution is not a Christian document. That is, America is not a Christian nation. Uh, what's the problem with that statement? What lie was Tyler buying into? Now, it was interesting at the time, they were referring to some articles written by A.T. Jones. 
A.T. Jones wrote a number of things on religious liberty. Would A.T. Jones argue that the United States is not a Christian nation founded upon Christian principles? What was the basis for religious liberty, according to A.T. Jones? Anybody know? You've read his, his stuff dealing with liberty. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. So A.T. Jones taught that the reason that we have religious liberty is because the American, America is a Christian nation. The, the, it's a Christian principle, the separation of church and state. That's what he argued when he argued against the Blair Bill. Now, he also argued that the reason that the state can't make laws, moral laws, such as a Sunday law, is because only God can deal with moral law. God has given us civil law, and states can deal with civil law. But that's a Christian principle. In order to get to the idea of the separation church, of church and state, you need the, Christ, the Christian principle, the pr principles of Protestantism, to establish that. So when we have the New Age and the left tearing down the Constitution and, and, and trying to claim that we have to have this separation between church and state, they're just going to have a the state controlled by an ideology that they don't consider religious. But it will be just as oppressive as any religious um, uh, institutions in, in that have existed in the past. Because it's still an ideology. It still, in a sense, is religious. The idea was not just religion, but no ideology should be able to control us because the, the Constitution gives us the freedom to make our own choices and our own beliefs. And that's a Christian principle because God gives us that freedom. It's an inalienable right. So, so when we deal with these liberal ideas, so if we get back to these liberal ideas that have come, in, come into the Protestant world, could we could we give examples of these that that Adventism has been adopting, that Christianity has been adopting, that the world has been um, affecting us? What what are the principles? What are the the manifestations showing this to occur? I know that's kind of a broad question. So we'll just go back to that statement here. So let's look at this statement again. It, and this is the religion, Catholicism, which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor and which will eventually be united with Protestantism. This union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. Now here this is talking about Catholicism. So we see that what, what is it that causes nominal Christianity to, to grasp hands with spiritualism? What did Ellen White say about spiritualism? What is it that, that happens that causes that to occur? What does spiritualism do? It imitates nominal Christianity, correct? Right, but it, you know, in my mind, takes it back to Jezebel and Ahab. 
as well. Okay. Can you expound on that a bit? Well, was Ahab walking according to God's law as he ruled with Jezebel? No. Was Jezebel more in charge than Ahab? Yeah. Now that's the woman, that's the church, that's the, the Catholic Church, right? Right. So Jezebel, because she was so very much tied with the priests of the grove. And the priests or, of the represent. I'm I'm saying the environmentalists, those that are seeking the methods of um, placing well, man above or placing the the earth above man. Yeah, or yeah, nature. We worship nature instead of nature's God. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's spiritualism. Okay, so, so we know that spiritualism adopts itself, it imitates nominal Christianity, and that is everything you see in the humanistic approach is it sounds caring, loving, um, you know, concern for nature, concern for people, when in reality it has, has no concern for either. It's really just about self, the people who are in charge. They're just using nice language. They can imitate Christianity, especially nominal Christianity, because nominal Christianity is all about love, isn't it? Right, but it, it, this is not truly love that they're expressing. Right, but they express that in their language in something that, that appeals to the Christian, to the nominal Christian. You know, I think about growing up with my dad, who, you know, is all about love. United Church of Canada, every sermon was about love. Um, but but the reality was that uh, they were bowing down to to nature instead of nature's God. You know, all of those, you know, the social gospel and, uh, and all those things dealing with, uh, I can't remember the word of it, dealing with um, liberation theology. Those types of ideas were very attractive to many Christians in the 1970s. You know, we don't hear about those things today. We have other things that have taken taken their place. But spiritualism, which really is just communism, it's, it's anti-theistic. It is just trying to destroy humanity. But it imitates Christianity to do so. But it's because of the adoption of liberal ideas on the part of Protestantism where we can where we will then clasp the hand of Catholicism. So so in a sense, the change really has happened with Protestantism. It's weakened it on both fronts. It's not protected against the inroads of spiritualism because it, 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 it's not obedient to God. And it, it doesn't see the Catholic Church as a threat because the reason that the, the Protestants unite with the Catholics is they, they seem to have the same goal. They believe that, they, that their goals are the same, that they have the same enemy. And, and so we saw that that happened. See, one of the things with this with this study that I'm still trying to sort out, and, and and you'll see as we get into this a little bit deeper. But one of the things that always puzzled me about the threefold union was 1989, because at that time the Soviet Union represented spiritualism, and Protestantism, and the papacy joined hands to conquer their common enemy. The Catholic Church is not interested in, sp in spiritualism. It has no sympathies with it. The Catholic Church is seeking 
its goals, but it will um, in conquering, they will accept the gods of the nations they conquer. So they have been seeking to conquer spiritualism, communism, even though that in many of their ways, they, they're actually their sentiments are much the same. The main difference is that the Catholic Church is an institution that wants to have complete control. It, it has to be on top. It has to be riding the beast. The Catholic Church is not going to be rode. So any other thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are again so thankful for the Sabbath. And we know, Lord, that um, there's many things that we still need to understand, but we just ask that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and help us in our personal study. We know that there is... Um, things in our midst going on, political things, um, things not according to thy will. And we know that this happens in our own hearts. We ask, Lord, that we can be united with you so that we can be united with one another. We pray for this movement. We pray for each individual. And we just ask, Lord, that you can help us in our day-to-day -day walk with you throughout this week ahead. And we pray that you can uh, bring us together again uh, tomorrow morning, for those that are able to continue our study in the book of Judges. Help us to understand the things that we read and study. And help us to be obedient to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.